Hello Interwebs, today I'm bringing you something very different to the norm. I like to do little personal projects now and then and document them. And if I find it interesting, then I wager that some of you guys will as well. Now, if you come into this video looking for the title topic and quick information on how to do it without all of my waffle, then check the chapters in the description down below to get straight to the point. Uh, past that, without further ado, let me introduce you to the world of full body tracking in VR. Now, I really like the idea of VR, and while there's not really a huge amount of games or other uses for it that can go beyond being a novelty or just an experience, I still love the idea and technology behind it. If you've never tried VR before, and even if you've got no interest in buying hardware, I'd keep an eye out for a chance to try it for yourself. It's amazing how novel the experience of just being in a virtual space and picking up virtual things actually is. One of my favourite things to do is just wandering around in VR chat, which is a wild place, let me tell you. Because not only can you stand in and look around a huge variety of virtual worlds made by other people, you can use all kinds of avatars to look like and be other people or things. And simple or not, seeing, yourself, seeing your virtual self in a mirror is extremely fun to me. And this is where the body tracking comes in. If I go into this avatar testing room in VRChat, I'll show you the side-by-side -side comparison of where I'm standing and how the system interprets that. Right now, we've got a head-mounted display, that's the headset, and two controllers. The headset is the authority here. It knows with absolute certainty where it is in real space because it has camera sensors mapping out its surroundings in real time. By extension, the headset can see and track where the controllers are, so it also knows exactly where my hands are. And as you can see, from this alone, I can tilt my head and I can wave my arms about. The system doesn't know exactly where my elbows are, but by watching the angle of the controllers, it can make a pretty good guess. But where this system really doesn't work particularly well is the chest and down. There's absolutely no way for the system to know where any of my lower body is. Like with the arms, it can try and guess and sort of drag my avatar's body around to follow the head movements, but again, we can kind of easily trick it into unnatural positions. So what if we could add another point of tracking? The most well-known way of doing this is something like the Vive Tracker, but these have got a lot of disadvantages. Not only are they bulky and expensive, but they require outside-in tracking. In other words, a VR rig using lighthouses. Now, my poor man's Rift S, as well as most other budget VR systems, use inside-out tracking, which means the cameras in the headset are what are tracking my position. The headset can't effectively see my body, so it wouldn't be able to track any, track any additional points, even if they were there. Even the controllers require some guesswork if they move out of the headset's vision for a moment. So if we can't track another point on my body, what if we had a device that could keep track of itself and then report back to the system with its current position and momentum? It would need six axes of sensing, meaning that it would have a gyro that knows which way is up, and an accelerometer that knows how far and how fast it's moving. We'd need it to have some kind of wireless connection to the computer as well, because we don't have a way to connect it directly to the headset. Well, my phone can do all those things. It's got a six-axis motion sensor, it's got Wi-Fi, and it can run apps. And it just so happens that there's an app called OO Tracker that runs on a smartphone specifically for this purpose. Um, it did have a companion app for Windows that served as the receiving end, but that's been deprecated, and it's been replaced with an app called Slime VR. Now, Slime VR is a very powerful body tracking server that's going to be crucial to our setup later on. But for now, I'm just going to do the bare minimum to get the phone working. We'll talk more about Slime VR a bit later. I'll set up the app on my phone, and I'll start Slime VR, and now my phone is seen as a tracking device. If I tell Slime VR that it's mounted on my hips, I can just put the phone on my belt to hold it in place. The mount button in Slime VR tells the system to figure out how I've mounted the phone, whether it's sideways or on my front or on my back or so on and then Reset will zero out its position, so the phone doesn't have to be perfectly aligned. Now if I step back into VR chat, I can do a full body tracking calibration, and now the system knows what position my hips are in. 
And as you can see, this means I can turn my body and look around far better than I could before. This is a really simple and free setup that immediately transforms the level of immersion that you get. So what are the limitations of this setup? Well, the system knows where my hips are, but it still doesn't know where my arms or legs are. It'll try to drag my feet around to follow, but we can still get it into weird poses where we haven't quite moved enough for the avatar to take a step. You can cover for this if you stand still and always use the controller to move, but if you have a larger play space, you're going to want the freedom of movement to actually walk around in it. At this point you might be wondering, well, can we just add more phones? And the answer to that is yes, we can add as many phones as we like. Slime VR also supports using Switch Joy-Cons as well. But unless you have a lot of phones laying around, this is kind of an expensive solution. And if you're thinking about buying some really cheap smartphones, well, don't forget that a really cheap phone is probably going to have a really cheap sensor in it. There's some phones that might not even have full six axis sensors. Additionally, in my testing of this, I also found that at least my Pixel 6, which is a pretty high-end phone, drifted a lot too, which means its virtual marker slowly drifts out of alignment with where it's supposed to be in the real world, and you have to recalibrate to realign it again. There are ways to deal with this, and SlimeVR does have some drift compensation and quick resetting and stuff like that, but either way, it's not the best user experience. However, given that our requirements of a 6-axis sensor, wireless and battery powered aren't actually that steep, we could probably just build our own trackers. And that's exactly what Slime VR is really good for. Their documentation has full guides on building your own trackers, the firmware to run them, and even reference designs for you to follow. All you have to do is buy the components. So let's make our own tracker. Now you can get designs for 3D printed cases for these, which are very good and make a really slick, neat looking device that you can attach straps to. But I'm the kind of guy that likes to blunder into something and figure it out, because that way you kind of learn why the official designs work and look the way they do. So mine are going to look kind of janky, and it's important to point out that the official Slime VR designs will look a lot slicker than mine. But this is just how I'm doing it, because I want to figure it out, and I want to use a lot of components that I've got lying around as well, instead of buying all of these recommended stuff. So to start with, we need a microcontroller. So this is a Wemos D1 Mini. It's based on the ESP8266 Micro. Uh, this is basically a super-powered Arduino with built-in Wi-Fi. It's designed to run Internet of Things widgets. Uh, the Slime VR documentation has a list of various other supported micros, but the D1 Mini is cheap, small, and very low power, so it's an easy choice for us here. The sensor that we're going to use is called an IMU. That's an Inertial Measurement Unit. There are lots of options for this, but the market is plagued with knockoffs and obsolete devices. And the problem there is that a bad IMU will drift. And if you're wondering how bad that drift could be, I can assure you that it can be really bad. So at the time of making this video, the community recommends using the BMI 160. Uh, this IMU doesn't seem to have a cloning issue. So if you buy one on eBay, you're probably going to get the real deal. And it's got very good tracking performance to boot. So we're also going to need to power the tracker. So I'm going to use a small LiPo cell for this. You can buy nice ones on eBay in various sizes, but I'm cheap, so I'm going to recycle cells that I've taken out of old laptop batteries. Don't do this unless you already have experience with building LiPo batteries. Just buy new cells. The other thing to bear in mind is because I'm using recycled cells, they're in questionable condition, so they might not give me the full runtime that I should theoretically get from a cell of this size. The micro can run directly on the bare cell, but it can't charge it or cut the power if the cell is flat. So we're going to want some kind of basic battery management. Now, on official designs, we'd add in a TP4076 board like this one here. And this guy can charge a LiPo cell by USB, and it also has a built-in protection chip, so it prevents the, ch the cell from being critically over-discharged. However, I'm going to omit this board because if I connect my uh, cell to my micro just using these JST cables, I can use that as a poor man's power switch. And then I'll just have a couple of TP4056 boards with also with some JST jumper cables on, and this will effectively serve as my battery charger. 
So I can just plug these into them in turn. I'll have a couple of these, plug them into my trackers in turn one by one until they're all charged up. And this means that I don't actually have to put this board on the tracker itself. Now this does mean that my design doesn't have over discharge cell protection. However, I will have charge level monitoring, so I'll know when the battery is low. And also, because I'm using recycled cells, I'm not really fussed if I accidentally leave one plugged in and lunch the cell. I'll just swap it out for another one. So my design's not going to be terribly friendly toward users who aren't electronically inclined, but it does mean that I can make some very compact trackers that are like, you know, half the size of the reference design. So I'll show you some of my prototypes and my thought process behind them, and then we'll make one from scratch, and then we can go back to the VR rig and test them out. So this was my one-off first attempt. I bought a, just a single micro and the cheapest IMU I could find because I wanted to check that everything would work in theory before I actually started spending any meaningful amount of money on this. I've never worked with these ESP microcontrollers before, and I was very dubious that I'd be able to actually get the firmware flashed and working properly. However, it was actually incredibly simple, and it actually worked the first time. The main problem with this tracker is that it has an MPU 6500 IMU on it, and it drifts like a stray party balloon. This makes for a really bad user experience, so if you've ever encountered someone who is using one of these IMUs, that's not representative of what the Slime VR experience can be like. Um, however, I thought I'd show you just as a, a demonstration of the direction I was hoping to go in with these. Now, this guy is my Mark II unit. It's got a TP46 board strapped onto it for charging and cell protection. Um, I bought some BMI 160s at this point. Uh, so this one actually performs really well. However, where I'm using this very simple pin header as a power switch, this is the point where I realized that the TP4056 board was kind of not needed. And unless I was actually planning on putting in a proper switch on these, it just didn't need to be there at all. And this led to my Mark III unit, which as you can see is literally just a cell, a micro, and the IMU uh, taped together. Um, so I've got a little bit of padding in between there just to make sure that the micro can't dig in through the cell as well. And I did think this was going to be the final design that I was going to make all of them look like. However, there were two more improvements that I wanted to test. The first one is to add a 180k resistor um, from the battery to another data pin on the micro. And Slime VR can use this to measure the battery voltage and thus give you a charge level. And this is really slick and works amazingly well. And the other thing that I wanted to do was um, I wanted to try moving the IMU to the side of the micro. Because after building these, as you can see, the stack ends up being unnecessarily tall. And you can catch this, you know, with a, you know, the cable can hook on it. And it's just generally taller than I thought that it was going to be. And it means that despite its simplicity, this isn't actually that compact, which was what I really wanted with this design. So that brings us to my Mark IV design, which I've decided is going to be my final. So as you can see, I've moved the IMU to one side and run extra wires over to it. I've also got my resistor wire hooked up. That's an SMD resistor, which I'll talk about in a moment. And I've also put some heat shrink wrap around this guy. So it's nicely packaged. There's no excess tape anywhere. And now this guy is really rugged. It's got some corners on it, but man, come on, this is that's that's pretty thin. Um, I'm really happy with this design. Uh, it can be thrown about. I can lob it down on the floor without fear that it's going to break. Um, and yeah, again, we've still got the long battery cables on it, but again, not super bothered about that. This just means that these are nice and non-fiddly for me. I could make these shorter if I wanted to. I'm just lazy. So this is the design that I'm going to build more of. And it's my intention to have eight of these. And that's going to be my ankles, my thighs, my chest, my hips, and my arms. So let's get started by preparing my battery with a JST plug on it. Now I'll put the other side of the JST wire onto the micro. Now, uh, I'm fairly lazy. And um, because I'm using thin wires, the soldering for this is going to be fairly forgiving. So I'm going to pre-fill the five volt and ground holes on here. And then I can basically just poke the wires through and reflow. 
and we're going in from the bottom here. All our other wires are going to go in through the top, but you'll see how this comes together. There's ground. There's power. Right. Now we have a micro and a power source. So the next thing I'm going to do is run my battery sense resistor line. So now I'm going to switch to my hookup wire. Uh, now, as I mentioned, I think this is 30 AWG wire. This is really thin, this stuff. Um, now, that comes with pros and cons. When, it's, when you have really thin wire like this, it's actually easier than it looks to work with because you can just use a pair of tweezers and just nudge it all into place. However, if you're not familiar with wiring up small electronics like this, you might find bigger wire is easier to handle. But also, bigger wire might not fit through so easily through the holes, so that can make the soldering process itself a bit harder. You might get stray strands bridging over to other pins and that kind of thing. So again, this is not really as intended as a tutorial, more just a demonstration of what you can do. So what I'm going to do now is um, I've got a short piece that I've already just uh, singed the ends on here. So I'm just going to touch that onto the 5 volt rail. I say 5 volt rail, it's actually just B+, plus, so it's whatever the nominal battery voltage is currently at. It will vary anywhere between 4.2, come on, it'll vary anywhere between 4.2 and about 3 volts. On the reference design, you'd have to run this all the way back to the cell. However, because I'm not using the 4056 board, um, I can just connect this directly to the input. Right, and this is the part where in order to show you what I'm doing, I'm going to switch down to a microscope. The resistor I'm going to be using is an 0603 SMD resistor. This is a completely needlessly chad move. Um, you don't need to use SMD parts, but these are all I have and I'm not buying more parts. So this is what we're going to use. So let's just pre-fill A0. There we go. And here is my needlessly small resistor that doesn't need to be this small, but whatever. This is where I live now. I just burnt a hole through my mat. It's okay. Missed. Okay. There we go. A little bit of exposure on that wire, but that's fine. Sorted. Now my BMI is going to go about here and we're going to put it about there. So now I need to get some more hookup wire ready for these connections. And we're going to start with the data lines. So I want, I want the clock, which is the middle one, then data. Clock to D1, data to D2 is the default. Again, you can change these in flashing, so if you accidentally screw it up, it doesn't matter. But as I mentioned, the less customization we do, the easier things are for flashing later on. What you don't really want to do is have to have make a mental note of how to flash these devices. That's a, that's a pain. Right. 
There we go, that's one. Now, despite the fact that I tried to measure these wires out very carefully, they're still going to end up being a little bit too long, but that's okay. I had a dream that I would uh, measure all of these out and they would be perfect lines. However, <laughs> so far, every time I've tried to do that, it hasn't really worked out. Right, so that's our clock and our data pins connected up. So you can see we've got clock and data on the bottom to D1 and D2, respectively. So now we need ground over to ground and the 3.3 volts to the 3.3 here as well. We can't run this guy directly off of the battery. The D1 can run off the battery because that 5 volt actually goes directly into a regulator which is why we can have a variable input to it and it not be an issue. Right, where are we going? Next one down. This guy might actually is a little bit on the short side. This wire needed to be longer. I think I'll get away with it though. Yeah, just long enough. Okay, now we just need a power cable. I keep calling them cables. There's no way you, these are big enough to be called cables. Oof, I cut this one fine as well. Man, after going way too long on the data lines, I just kept underestimating for these ones. That's okay though, I can make it work. Once again, I want to reiterate that this is not the sort of intended reference design for these things. I'm just doing it this way just to, because I like to try and do something a little bit different and also just demonstrates other ideas. In a DIY community like this, people like seeing alternate takes on how to build stuff. People coming up with their own personal interpretations of it. So let's check ground. Also, did I even do that correct? Those are entirely the wrong way around. Yeah, my power lines are the wrong way around because I'm an idiot. Good job. Well, the good news is now they're long enough. Imagine if I actually used some helping hands like a sensible person. There we go. Well, the good news is those wires are not so stressed now. All right. So we'll buzz these out again just to make sure that I haven't bridged anything. So let's go five volts. Oh, that doesn't go to the board. It's 3.3 .3 volts. Yeah. And it's not going to any of the adjacent pins. Ground goes to ground and none of the adjacent pins. D1 goes to clock. Hello? D1 goes to clock? Ah. Oh no, clock is the second one down. Yep, no, that's correct. And D2 goes to data. There we go. All right. 
That boy is good to go. So technically now, I can plug a USB cable into this, flash the firmware to it, and this will just work. Um, just as that. That's all it is. That's all that's necessary. Everything else is support. So now I shall wrap it up. So I'm going to cut a square of this foam I've got. This was just some packaging that came with another product. It just so happens to be an appropriate width. So we'll put that there. And I'm deliberately leaving a gap at the end of it for the uh, USB port. Because we don't want that to... Um, we need we, That needs to be gapped out. It's going to go like that. Now I'm going to take this heat shrink that I've got. This stuff is barely large enough, but the next size up I have is too large. So we've just got to go with what we've got. And we're going to take about that much. It will shrink down in the length a little bit as well as the width. Now I have to very carefully thread the whole thing into here. Preferably without the foam going sideways. Right, is that looking good? I think that's going to look good. Can fix that corner in a minute. And I'm deliberately making sure that the USB port can stick out a little bit just so I can actually plug in a USB cable. And that means that our end product, that USB port, is still accessible. It looks like it's a very difficult access, but it does work. That should do it. I think that's about perfect. All right. Let's shrink it. go we've pulled in a little bit more than I would like on the end there but that hasn't it that's only exposed ground points so that's absolutely fine with me what I don't want is any live connections exposed so if it bumps against something metal it would short out against something however that that's worked out just fine and we've slightly blocked off the reset button on the micro but not in a way that bothers me you can just kind of fingernail that yeah, I can actually click that with my fingernail. So if I really need the reset button, then I've got it. However, just unplugging and plugging in the battery again achieves exactly the same thing. And there we go. Oh, you know what I heckin' forgot. Oh, forgot the strap. So my straps, this is just elastic. And you can buy this elastic from any hardware store or sewing store. And it's just elastic. It's designed for repairing clothing with... And uh, I've bought like just two meters of this stuff um, and I'm literally just tying it in knots and then I can just put it like this is one of these for my thigh and that will just stretch around my thigh no problem at all. And it actually gives a pretty good fit. I'm going to try and find some some hoops that I can put in, some, um, uh, some tie back things so I don't have this ugly knot. However, just for these prototypes, this works just fine. So I'm going to undo this knot just so I can lay it flat. I tend not to shrink as hard as it can go because um, you will put unnecessary amounts of strain into it and then the slightest pierce and it will just split. All right, there we go. So our IMU is a little bit sideways in that one. It's not as flat as the first attempt here. As you can see, that guy is more level in there than this one. However, this is basically irrelevant. Calibration irons out all of that. Like, we have to keep in mind that it's not going to be perfectly straight when it's strapped to my body. So, um, although this is not as nice um, aesthetically, it's perfectly acceptable. Good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of my previous attempts and I'm going to disassemble these and remake them in the new style. So I should end up with, um, hopefully, a whole bunch of these guys. See you after the cut.
Okay, so we've got a selection of eight trackers all built and ready to go. But first, I need to flash and calibrate them. So uh, I've gone to the Slime VR online firmware flasher, which is linked in from the documentation, as all things are. And I'm just going to quickly fly through these options with you. So firstly, we can select the firmware revision. Um, so as of the time of recording this, the best one to be using is just the mainline Slime VR 033 firmware, unless told otherwise. The other firmware options have other weird peculiarities to them for using very specific IMUs or other stuff. However, as of at the moment, mainline Slime VR is all you need. So we're running that. Um, so the board we're using, we have a Wemos D1 Mini. Uh, under the advanced options, I can specify which pins I'm using for clock and data and the LED pin if applicable. So this is where we can change how we've wired up our trackers if we changed that. But this is also exactly why I wired to very specific pins so I wouldn't have to change anything here. So I can leave all of this as standard. So the IMU that I'm using is the BMI 160, so I'm going to select that. Um, the secondary IMU, uh, you can have an auxiliary IMU, which allows you to run effectively two trackers from a single microcontroller. This is particularly useful, for example, your ankle trackers, where you can have an ankle tracker that has an extra IMU on the foot. Uh, this is the setup that I'm going to be moving to, but I haven't built any of these yet. Um, then the other thing we need to check is the rotation for the IMU. So this is what orientation the IMU is in in your tracker. Uh, now, I, um, uh, I have built my trackers in such a way that they can go any way up. Uh, in this instance, if I have it so the writing, um, the Wi-Fi logo on my micro is the correct way up, that puts the um, IMU at rotation zero, which is incredibly convenient because, again, it means I don't have to change anything. But if my IMU was mounted at a 90 degree angle, for example, I would need to dial in either 90 degrees or 270, depending on what rotation it was at. So pay attention to that when you're building. Again, the documentation contains guides for which rotation is which orientation. So I can leave that as zero. Uh, my battery sense, again, we have this hooked up. Uh, we've got a 180 K ohm resistor to a zero. No changes required there. And then finally, we have Wi-Fi settings. Um, so for the Wi-Fi, you can set this afterwards in the Slime VR server, but I found it's more consistent to do it at the point of flashing if you're able to. So I'm going to go ahead and bash in my Wi-Fi details. And that's that done. So let's hook up our tracker. So I'll start with this guy. So I'm going to plug in the USB. And up in the top left here, it wants me to select the COM port. So in most conditions, you should find that there's only a single device here. If you've got any other weird stuff connected to your computer, you might have more than one. So you'll need to figure out which one is your tracker. If in doubt, just unplug everything else. And now the tool is automatically downloading, building, and flashing the firmware. So this only takes just a few seconds. So I'll let that run through. Now I'm all programmed up, the next thing I need to do is calibrate my IMUs. So for the BMI 160, the calibration process is a fairly complicated one, but it's a one-time event. So what I've done is I've put my tracker in this foam cube here that I've cut a wedge out of, and this allows me to place it on any side at 90 degree angles, like so. Um, now, in order to show you guys what's happening, I'm going to leave the serial um, cable connected. And this means that in order to do the, uh, the bottom where the strap knot is and this side where the cable is, I'm going to balance it on this mug. So it's going to look kind of jank, but trust me on this, it does work. Um, now, the more precise your jig is, the better your calibration will be. However, even a fairly rough calibration will still function. Uh, there's lots of methods for getting really good calibrations. Um, but once again, this is something to discuss amongst the community. So for now, I'm just going to bash a basic calibration into all of these. So once again, I'll show you the serial console output so you can see what's happening as I go through the process. So in Slime VR, I'm going to go to serial console. And if you wait for 10 seconds, you should see the tracker spitting out a status update every 10 seconds or so. Um, and there's my one. 
So what I'm going to do to start calibration, I'm going to hold it upside down, reboot it, and then turn it the right way up. And this will tell the IMU that I want to calibrate. Once we do that, it will then guide me through placing in all the orientations. So here goes nothing. I'm holding it upside down. Here's the reboot. Flip front to confirm start calibration. And now I'm immediately going to set it down on the mug and leave it. So firstly, it will do a gyro calibration. Now it's going to ask for the six orientations. So there's orientation one. We'll leave it as it will leave it alone. So now for position two, I'll turn it over. Position three. Position four. Oh, trying to make it so the cable isn't pulling it around. <clears throat> position five. And position six. And there we go. That's our calibration done. It saved all of this information into the micro, and we don't have to do that again. That's a one-time thing. Okay, so I'm all kitted up. I've got all of my goofy straps on and all of my trackers are in place. So I've already run through the calibration and body measurements for Slime VR. Um, so go through the instructions and the documentation to learn how to do this, but I'm not gonna do a complete walkthrough of the program because this video is already too long. However, uh, now we've got them on, let's drop back into the avatar testing chamber and see how my Regulus avatar responds to having full body tracking. I'm going on the game grid, everyone. Right, so we're back in, and as you can see straight away, I can just lift up one foot and we are completely tracked for both legs now. And I've placed my two extra trackers on my feet, so I can even just pivot my foot, and that is also tracked in-game as well. And this is important because this means that I can stand on my tiptoes in the game too. And it knows whether I'm doing that. I can even do it on one. And that's different from just lifting my foot. So it can tell when I'm lifting a foot or when I'm actually standing on tiptoe. And you might ask yourself, well, what's this good for? Well, if you're doing any kind, if you're doing any kind of activity that involves body tracking, like dancing or yoga or anything like that, it can actually pick up these intricate movements now. And I can walk around naturally. And as you can see, the avatar just looks like a completely normal character that is completely fully tracked. So if I wanted to, I can build another two, arm tra two trackers for my arms, which I shall probably do at some point, just because that was one of the original examples I gave. But in my testing, I found that having the trackers on my feet is more useful for what I'm doing in game. Um, because it just gives me better foot positioning. It helps avoid skating, it helps keep the feet planted. As you can see, there's a little bit of motion here and there. This can be ironed out through lots of fine tuning of the settings. However, for the purposes of the test, it's good enough. So let's do the other acid test of just sitting down now. So if I sit down, ooh. now, my feet do clip through the floor a little bit with this avatar because this Regulus avatar has got big old thick thighs and big old paws on the bottom of it. Certain avatars are better than others for this. It depends on hitboxes. But for the sake of principle, I can sit down and I can even lay down now. And as you can see, it can tell exactly what position I'm in no matter how silly I look. Like that. Oof. There we go. And once I get up, I might have to just shuffle my clothing a bit because when I sit down and get up, my clothing rides up and down and that moves the trackers, which can knock me out of alignment. But touch wood, actually. That's actually stayed pretty well on track. So that's actually a pretty good run for me. There are some tests where doing that, a tracker can move through, you know, 10 degrees or so and just suddenly your leg goes sideways. So as you can see, this is a tremendous difference from the original stiff avatar that couldn't even tell where my body was facing. 
because we now at this point where we've got separate chest and hips, I can even turn my upper bot my, my chest without my hips, or I can turn my hips without moving my chest, and it knows where my entire body is. So it's a tremendous upgrade from even having just the bare hip tracking alone. And it just completely brings the character to life. So that's the end of me gushing about it working. Um, I'm so thrilled with the, how this has come out. Uh, let's go back to the bench and I'll just record my final thoughts with you and we'll close out this video. So that's the end of my full body tracking adventure. And at the start of this video, I kind of made an offhand remark about how VR was a little bit of a gimmick and didn't have a lot of uses. But the funny thing is, through making, these, through making this tracker set up and joining in with the Slime VR community, I've been going to a lot of their VR meetup events where they do yoga, dancing, mini golf, other games, just meet and chat, calibrate and chat, where people just show up and talk about their setups and tweak their setups and get the best out of what equipment they've got. And it's been such a good time. I've actually done the most VR activities, the most immersive stuff, and the most fun, interactive, community-driven stuff that I've done ever with the Slime VR community. So the unexpected takeaway from this is that going down the full body tracking route so you can do more in VR greatly enhances the experience beyond anything that I originally envisioned that it would. So I hope you guys found that kind of interesting from a technical perspective and also as this mini journey that I went on. So thanks for tuning in. Thank you as always to all of my channel supporters, including my YouTube members, my Twitch subscribers, and my Patreon crowd. And I hope to see you guys in the next video. And also, if you enjoyed this content and you want more stuff regarding VR and or the Slime Full Body Tracking setup, let me know in the comments because I would love to do more content on this. I just don't know how much you guys are going to be interested. But yeah, thanks for tuning in and I'll see you all next time. Bye for now.